Entitled people get assault victim expelled from school. Background. I went to a very small religious high school, graduating class less than 20 people. It was so small it didn't even actually have a campus. It used double wides with pop-up walls as classrooms. Education was actually pretty good. The classes were small enough that teachers could give people individual attention, and parents paid a premium to make sure their children were getting a proper, religious-based education. Science classes didn't teach evolution, church on Wednesdays, Bible class was mandatory, etc. The majority of the church slash school were wonderful people. So, it was a great community, most of the time. Also, I'm not here to start a debate on whether abortion is good or bad. I believe the decision is entirely up to the person, as you know the situation that led to them choosing. Please keep an open mind. The reasons will become apparent later. To the story. My freshman year of high school, I made friends with a fellow artistic type, who shared most of my classes. I'm gonna call her Candy. Candy and I got along swimmingly. She shared a lot of my beliefs. We could talk to each other openly. We also liked a lot of the same movies, books, artwork. So, needless to say, if I had a class with her, we were practically glued together. One day around March, I noticed Candy wasn't in school. First she was gone a few days, then it turned into weeks, and then months. The school year ended, and I had no idea what happened to her. This was a time before cell phones were very popular, and I didn't know her home number to keep in contact. None of the teachers knew anything. A few just told me, oh, her mother took her out of school with no further explanation. Next year, my sophomore year, in the middle of November classes, she returned. She just appeared at school early morning and started going back to classes. I didn't have any classes with her this year, and it took a while before I caught her in between classes to catch up. I noticed right away that she seemed completely different. Her bright, bubbly spirit was gone. She looked sick and very pale. She wasn't wearing makeup and she no longer took the time to do her hair and braids anymore. I asked her where she had been. What happened to her last year? Why did she drop out of school? Why didn't you start this year in September with the rest of us? Are you sick? She didn't really seem up to talking. She just mumbled an excuse. My family was going through some stuff and my mom thought it was best to take me out of school. For the next several weeks, we only really talked during lunch, and I used the term talked loosely. She wouldn't talk about her absence. If I asked her if she had seen the latest popular movies, she would say, I don't really watch movies anymore, or I'm not really that interested. Candy had become a completely different person. I decided to give her some space. One day after winter break, I was staying late after school to finish an art project. The art room was used as kind of an after-school study hall. I heard the door open, and I turned around and there was Candy. She had been crying. Her eyes were red and puffy. She said between sobs, Do you mind if I hang out in here while I wait for my mom to come pick me up? I immediately abandoned my work and went over to console her. She broke down almost immediately. After about 15 minutes of crying and hugs, she finally opened up to me. Turns out the reason she had been gone was because she had gotten pregnant. Even worse, the father of her baby was her own father. Apparently she had been the victim of abuse from her biological father for several years. When she realized he had gotten her pregnant, she finally spoke up to her mother. Her mother had immediately taken her out of school and moved to another state to stay with family. They called the police. Her dad got arrested and pled guilty right away. He knew he had no argument. The DNA of the baby proved her story. Shortly after her dad's arrest, she had gone to a clinic and had an abortion. This was something that our church's religion strictly forbid, but she told me I couldn't stand the idea of possibly giving birth to an inbred baby and having him suffer. She had gone through hell and back. I was beyond shocked. I continued comforting her as best as I could. After a long talk, she seemed better. She apologized for giving me the cold shoulder when she came back. Apparently one of the conditions of her returning to our school was she couldn't talk about the abortion. The church who ran the school wouldn't condone her choice to abort rather than adopt out her baby. She may not have been talking about it, but someone working for the school slash church sure had. Apparently someone had told one of the mothers of a fellow student, and he had been accusing Candy of unaliving her baby during class today. They had brought her to tears and she went to the principal's office to calm down. The guidance counselor had basically told her, you should cry. You took away an innocent life. God is going to punish you. She decided to wait for her mother in the study hall to get away from the office staff and their accusations. Her mother picked her up shortly after our talk concluded. She hugged her daughter and tried to reassure her. She put her daughter in the car, then walked back towards the office to give those teachers a piece of her mind. I wish I could have been there to hear her tear them a new one. It must have been an epic yelling match, because the next day, Candy wasn't in school. She never came back, and I never heard from her again. That Wednesday during chapel, the principal made an announcement. Some of you may have heard rumors that a fellow student at the school has been engaging in some unchristian behavior and had been making some poor life decisions, including the sin of abortion. Everyone knew who he was talking about. Small school in the rumor mill was powerful. He explained the church had agreed to let her return to school to help her regain her life and education. They said God would forgive her sin if she confessed and felt contrition for her decision, but she had refused to say she had done any wrong. Apparently several parents of students had been complaining that the girl's lack of guilt over her abortion was a bad influence on the other students. They were worried she would encourage other young ladies to make ungodly choices. As a result, the principal had asked Candy to leave the school. They expelled a teen girl from school. 
because she had aborted her inbred assault baby, and they had tried to guilt trip her by calling her terrible things and saying she'd corrupt the other girls. Several students were in an uproar over the way the school had treated Candy. I spoke to my parents that night, hoping they would back me up. Even they said Candy had made the wrong choice and deserved the punishment that came with her bad choices. Several friends said their parents had been less than supportive too. I couldn't fathom the contempt they showed Candy following one of the worst possible things that could happen to a young girl. She was betrayed by her father, her community, and her faith. I never heard from Candy again. Candy, I hope that wherever you are, that you are well and you know that you are loved. This story is a prime example of exactly how religion shouldn't be. It should not be a vehicle to tear other people down simply because you don't agree with them, especially when someone takes action because of a situation that they were forced into by somebody else. It doesn't matter what faith you're a part of. If there are people in your community that are tearing down others like this, they deserve to be called out. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever to have such a negative impact on somebody else's life simply because of what you believe. So, yes, in my opinion, the school was absolutely in the wrong. Story 2. My sister-in-law got a new engagement and wedding band and it's the exact same one as mine. My sister-in-law copied my engagement ring and I'm trying not to get pissed off. My sister-in-law has always hated me. From the moment I got with my now husband, her husband's twin, she has always hated me. The first thing she ever said to me was that I am the longest lasting girlfriend. And since that day, there has been this weird unspoken competition where she is always trying to belittle me, make me feel small and insecure. At first it used to work, but now it just pisses me off. She bragged about seeing my husband, boyfriend at the time, naked before. She's made comments about my sister's marriage unnecessarily. She's just jealous or something and always has something to say to demean me. She goes and changes into outfits that match mine and literally copies me and everything. Well, me and my husband got married recently and he bought me a new ring because of our new journey in life. Because we had grown so much. And then today, I went to my mother-in-law's house to celebrate someone's birthday. And she's there with my husband twin. I look at her and she copied my ring. Exactly. My husband bought me a new 5 carat pear rose gold double halo ring, and she has the exact same thing. I am so, so, so angry. Added note, she also copied her other sister-in-law's engagement ring. My husband has seven brothers and the eldest got married first, and then she did and had the exact same ring as that girl too. So I know this behavior isn't random or a coincidence. I'm trying to contain myself because it's not a big deal and it's just materialistic things, but I'm fuming and I'm so annoyed. I literally don't want to talk to her at all this trip. Should I confront her or should I leave it alone? Edit. I was with my husband and his twin and I asked him, Oh, I saw XXX got the new ring. He explained that he got her a ring because they had been together for five years, and allegedly a new ring is what you would give someone on that five-year mark. He kinda wasn't making sense and kept stuttering. He did admit that he didn't even buy it, but then backtracked and said he bought the ring and the wedding band separately. I thought it was all weird and kinda didn't make sense and I usually transition the conversation to something else. I'm not as angry, but more just like, who wants to have the same ring as someone else in your family? Like, wouldn't you want something unique? But it is what it is. Our wedding bands will look completely different. Edit 2. Just got home and feeling so down because I've been dealing with her for six years now. She wants to copy my ring and belittle me about being a mom slash wanting kids now that she has her own. I was super nice today and interacted with her and joked, and looking back on it, I hated it, and I wish I could have continued to give her the cold shoulder. I really don't know how to navigate this relationship anymore, and we are supposed to be spending the holiday at her house, and I'm about to just stay home by myself since I know my husband will still likely go. I know this seems dramatic, but goodness gracious, I have been nothing but kind to her, and only confronted her once which resulted in me being wrong, because I should have just left it alone and now I'm sick of it. Absolutely sick of it. Update. So everyone has been asking for an update. Here are a few things. Why this upsets me is because she has been bullying me since I got into the family and it is annoying for me to share a ring with someone who has been bullying me for so long. On top of the fact that I personally believe your engagement and wedding ring should be unique to your relationship and it's annoying she has no sense of originality. Talk to my husband about it. We actually argued until he understood, but it is now agreed that I am just not going to talk to her. She's literally not worth talking to and after further thinking and reflecting, she waits for me to talk to her. She doesn't engage with me after the initial hello. She just stared at me the majority of the time waiting for me to acknowledge her. And I don't know why, but I'm just going to hover around my husband because she's kind of afraid of him. But overall, she just constantly stares at me when we are together, which I think is weird, so I'm assuming she's low-key watching my every move, which is just weird. I won't confront her because the minute she catches an attitude, it'll be an immediate argument and fight. On Saturday during dinner, I asked if she'd be participating in other activities with us, and she got an attitude randomly, because I was confirming she didn't want us to buy an extra ticket. My husband bought her the second activity. His twin paid for dinner. She immediately got an attitude with me for no reason, and I almost snapped at her, but my husband grabbed my hand and answered for me. He confirmed her attitude was unwarranted, and if I were to confront her, the attitude would set me off. 
so I'm not saying anything to her. Adding this real fast, I've also reflected on that she thrives off of me talking to her. Unless I'm asking her about her life or kind of kissing up to her, she's in an amazing mood and so happy to brag and lie. So I think killing her with kindness, which I have been doing, only makes her feel better. So I'm going to act as if she doesn't exist, and if she talks to me, it'll be very bland and bored with our conversation. I'm debating between getting my ring customized. We have a jeweler friend who would customize it for us. Not sure if I'd want to do it or not, i just like to have something original and my own. But that is still up in the air. In conclusion, she is crazy and extremely insecure and is unhappy with herself and her marriage. She bullied her husband, and everybody knows it. She's a compulsive liar and doesn't like me for some reason, which is fine. I'm going to start acting like she doesn't exist. The only reason I tried being nice to her constantly is because everyone in the family doesn't like her, and wish the other twin didn't marry her, so I didn't want her to feel alone, but whatever. She can happily be ostracized and ignored because I'm the only person, aside from my mother-in-law and her husband, who gives her an ounce of attention. I think she's miserable and that has nothing to do with me, and the more I talk to her, the more ammo she can receive. And I do understand this is a first world problem, but I just wanted to vent. The Kim, people are passing away comment made me laugh. And I also realized I shouldn't put so much energy and emotions into something so small. I had my time to be annoyed and upset about it. But thank you all for listening slash reading me rant and vent. I've blocked her on my Instagram stories and removed her from close friends, but I can't really stop posting on social media because that's my job. But I'm going to be more careful about what I share. I think that's everything. Thank you so much for your words of kindness and advice. I appreciate it. Yeah, this sister-in-law seems very petty, and I think that cutting her off is absolutely the right choice here. Like, it takes an almost professional level of pettiness to go this far. It's honestly kind of sad. Story 3. 12 entitled people in an Airbnb designed for 6. Cost me $600. Thought you might enjoy my second, thirsty story. I posted previously here about a client of mine with a similar story, but this is the origin story that happened years before that other post. My wife and I own a mountain cabin, and a few years ago we decided to put it up on Airbnb. The place is a remote A-frame on three acres of forested land with awesome views, and it's about 30 minutes from a ski resort. This was our first Airbnb, so we were pretty cautious with everything, i.e. looking at guest past reviews, asking them about their trip to make sure this place would suit them, etc. Everything was going well until the entitled people booked the whole weekend for Thanksgiving. They told us they were driving out from Texas. Mom, dad, three little kids, and two dogs. Being that this was our first holiday rental, we went all out for them. We set a turkey to defrost in the fridge for them and left out a snack platter and a couple of bottles of champagne. They arrive on Sunday night and the next few days, all hell breaks loose. I get a call 6am Sunday morning. The whole family is puking and absolutely sick. They all had altitude sickness. The cabin is at 11,000 feet above sea level. So this happens, especially when you aren't in shape and just came from sea level. I did warn the guests about this ahead of time. So I'm on the phone talking them through everything, where the urgent care is, what to do, etc. By day two, things have calmed down. However, when I take a look at our water cistern gauge, remote monitored, this house has what we call a slow well recovery system. Basically, at some times of the year, the well might only produce around 60 gallons per day instead of the usual 300 plus. So we have a 500 gallon water storage system that helps smooth out the demand curves. Basically, once the tank goes below 40%, the well starts pumping. And if the well goes dry, a timer gets started and it will pump again in three hours until the tank is topped up. Full description and listing and guidebook. This system is more than adequate for six guests. Also, the house only has one bathroom and a 40 gallon hot water tank, so it's not like anyone can take long showers. It's all on the listing, it's a rustic place. Tactically speaking, we just ask guests to conserve water, but the system is fully automatic and no one even knows it's there. Well, after 48 hours, I checked our tank monitor to see it's around 35% full, which means the guests use all of the storage, plus what the well can produce in two days. I'm estimating nearly 700 gallons of water. I literally thought something must be broken because there is no way two parents and three little kids use that much. Like, perhaps the well fuse popped and got nothing from the well. So now I'm freaking out thinking that this nice family is going to be out of water on Thanksgiving. I called her politely and asked if they can serve water and had them reset the system, aka turn the breaker on and off. So I basically said I'd monitor it for three hours and if I didn't see the levels make progress, I'd get a water truck in. This would be literally a first as I've never needed to do it. Her response, sounds good but hurry because we drink a lot of water. How weird of a comment is that? Is if five people drinking a gallon a day, max, somehow equates to the hundreds of gallons missing from the system. Well, there is really no change in water level after three hours, so I get on the phone to book a water truck. And it is now one day before Thanksgiving, so it's just not happening. So I now need to figure out how to transport water to this house. I live one and a half hours away. I went to Farm and Tractor Supply and bought a 275 gallon tank that would fit my truck, plus hoses and pumps. Then drive up there, figure out where I can buy bulk water from, and go to the house. I finally get there around 4pm. 
and the guests are out but gave me permission to go inside and test things out, aka I wanted to make sure the system was working. It was, so they really did use that. I went inside and found two huskies in a crate who had pooped themselves and it was all over the place and it smelled gross. The owners said they could be back up and they would clean it up. At this point, I've been working on this for 8 hours. I'm sick, it's 10 degrees outside, and I'm now hooking up the transfer pump. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving and I still need to get to my parents' house, thankfully only 30 minutes from the cabin. I start pumping when I see their car pull up and they are waiting at the bottom of the driveway. Knowing they have small kids, I go down and say hi and let them know that they can go on in and I'll be done in about 40 minutes. They started to act real odd at this point, but go ahead in. Then I saw two more cars on the side of the road around the switchback, big steep bend in front of the house, and it clicks. The reason I just did all of this work and spent nearly $600 on supplies is because these people had 12 people staying there. If you are all curious as to how I didn't notice when I went inside, I didn't snoop around. I just went straight to the breaker box and then went to the crawl space where the tanks are. Also, the smell from the dogs was just horrid, so I got out as fast as possible. At this point, I went up to the front door, knocked and said, be honest with me. How many people do you have staying here? Her, um, nine. I could see she was lying, but even that number was over our legal capacity because of our permit. Me. You realize that this listing is for six people. Her. Well, there are beds for more people and the kids have a crib, and we don't know our family wanted to come when we booked it. The loft does have a pull-out couch, so best case they are sleeping for eight adults, but I'm guessing people were sleeping on the couches as well. Me. I just spent $600 plus a full day to solve a problem that was actually not a problem. Her. Well, the house should have water. Me. The house system was designed and tested for six. The stated number on the listing. I don't know how you think it's okay to have this many people here. Her. We could leave, but it would be tomorrow and we expect a refund. Because we don't want to drive down these roads in the dark with our kids. It's maybe 6 p.m. at this point. No service at the cabin, so I went to town and got the Wi-Fi at the local bar and called Airbnb. At this point, I had been hosting for three months and had no idea how to handle the situation, but now I was more afraid that they would damage something in the house. So Airbnb canceled the reservation and asked them to leave the house. I was able to recover around $200 for a deep cleaning on the house and they didn't get a refund. On a funny note, at the beginning of this year, I started a hot tub service company with water trucking as a service we offer, and I used some of that equipment to get started. If you are renting out an Airbnb, you need to abide by the owner's rules. It is still their house at the end of the day, even if you're renting it out. Simply having a little decency is not a difficult thing to do, although it seems like for plenty of adults it is a near impossible task. Story 4. Entitled neighbor leaves a note on my car every single week. I live in an apartment building with no parking, so I have no choice but to park on the street. My street also has a school on it that prohibits parking on its side Monday to Friday until 6pm. The other side was 2 hour parking even for permit holders. The entire area is permit parking only, which I have. So there are a total of about 7 spots on my block where permit holders can leave their cars. Because of this, I can never get a spot on my block and I park one block down, which is the same permit zone. This area is all houses and each one has a driveway. I typically don't use my car every day, but never go without it for long stretches unless I'm traveling. It's also a parking violation here to leave your car in one spot longer than 72 hours, which apparently some people take very seriously. Recently, one of my neighbors has been leaving a note on my car every single week. This is not an exaggeration. I've gotten four notes in the last four weeks citing the above parking code, even if my car has only been there for less than two days. The note always says that I can't leave my car in one spot for multiple days, which technically I have 72 hours. I always ignore the note because even if I do get reported, which I'm sure I have been, someone from the city comes out the next day for an inspection and then monitors the vehicle for the next 72 hours to see if it's still there. This law is really to prevent abandoned vehicles, not for people getting upset about cars parked in front of their houses for multiple days. The hilarious part is that the note goes on to say how disrespectful it is to your neighbors to leave your cars parked in front of their houses, but constantly leaving notes on cars is totally respectful. This has been going on for months, but it was the first time I got four notes in a row, and now I'm going for the high score. I know it's a law and I rarely leave my parked car in one spot for longer than three days, never more than a week unless I'm traveling, in which case I leave it at the office to avoid street sweeping. Also my car is an old, dirty, or looks abandoned. This person truly just has nothing better to do with their life. Honestly, I don't think either side is correct here in this story. OP should probably be a little more open about communicating with their neighbor, and the neighbor should probably not go on with posting this passive-aggressive note. I got fired for accidentally being a jerk to the company owner's disabled daughter. This happened on Friday. I've been drowning my sorrows all weekend, dreading the fact that I have to start looking for a new job. 
Explaining why I got fired from my old job is going to be fun. I'm typing it up here to try and organize my thoughts in my head, because right now it's all a mess. I had been with the company for three months and was still on orientation. My job was sales slash advertising. As the new guy, I was given existing accounts to manage, which consisted of providing customer service and convincing my clients to spend more money on advertising. All of these accounts already had their ad campaigns done, and if they wanted something new, the account was transferred to a senior account manager who would work with our advertising guys to put something together for the customer. Eventually, I hoped to have that job, but I had to pay my dues by proving I could maintain existing accounts and convince them to spend more money first. Everything was going great, until last week, when we were scheduled to have our quarterly retreat. Since we were the main regional office in the area, all the employees from the satellite locations came to our office for the retreat. The owner of the company rarely visits our office. He's been overseeing the setup of a new satellite office for the last year, according to my coworkers. but he was there for the retreat, as was his disabled daughter, Amy. Not her real name, for the sake of privacy. One of my coworkers told me Amy works in one of the satellite offices and I probably wouldn't have much interaction with her, but I should be nice. That seemed like a no-brainer. I'm nice to everyone, regardless. I won't claim to be an expert on Amy's disability, but it seemed like she had childlike mannerisms and struggled with expressing herself. She also had some problem with motor skills. I'll describe the only interaction I had with her prior to the incident. I went to refill my coffee and Amy was in front of me, getting her coffee. I watched her struggle with getting condiments added and putting the lid on, so I politely asked if she needed any help. She thanked me, said she did, and let me finish making it. While I was making it, she said she hated coffee, but her dad made her drink it because she had to, in a loud voice. Always alert. I smiled, said that was definitely important, and handed her the cup. She thanked me again and went back to the office her dad was using, where she had been most of the day. I felt like I had been a good Samaritan and went on my way. Most of the retreat is team building exercises. Prior to the incident, Amy only participated in the puzzle race, where groups put puzzles together without the box art to see which team can finish faster. Amy wasn't in my group, so I didn't have any interaction with her there. Neither of our teams won. The big event, and the one that everyone seemed the most excited for, was the last activity of the day. Our boss gave us a list of potential clients. We were supposed to select three as a group, and put together something to attract the customer. We were told we would be judged on our creativity. My group explained that we could do pictures, slogans, jingles, whatever we wanted. Each person expected to work on one individually, then work with their group to polish it up before it was presented to everyone. It was kind of a big deal because at previous retreats, there would be clients on the list the owner was already close to bringing on board, and if you impressed the owner, you might just land that account. I went with a jingle, rhymed a few words, and recorded it. It was silly but fit the brand. My group gave me some pointers. We made some improvements. And I recorded the final product for submission. I helped my team with their projects until it was time to turn everything in. After everything was turned in, we gathered in the big conference room to critique each other. The owner went through them one by one. If it was a picture or storyboard, he'd put it up, read it, and we'd make comments. Good or bad. There were some that were great, which drew a lot of compliments, and some that were really bad, which we laughed about as a group. We could tell the senior account managers didn't care much about the exercise or put much effort into their pitches. Nobody seems to get upset or offended, regardless of the feedback. When my jingle was played, it got a lot of comments. Not all of them good, and I took the feedback with a smile. After getting my feedback, I felt a little more comfortable about sharing my thoughts on other presentations. I gave what I thought was valuable feedback to a couple products, laughed at a couple others, and then a rather crude drawing was put up for the exact same company I had chosen. I immediately joked that, well at least my jingle was better than that, did a three year old draw it, and laughed, to absolute silence. I was really confused because plenty of people had made jokes and everyone laughed. Instead, a few people looked at me like I was disgusting, and the owner said, well if you don't have anything nice to say, keep it to yourself maybe. Then my boss scooted down to where I was sitting and told me I needed to go to my desk, now. I noticed as I was gathering my things that the owner's daughter was red faced and starting to tear up. The team building exercise was over for me. I went back to my desk and it began to sink in that the drawing must have been drawn by the owner's daughter. There was no warning or anything. The owner didn't reveal who put together what we're looking at until after a few critiques. Maybe I should have known. Everyone was joking and having fun up to that point. Someone else had a pretty bad drawing they got laughed at. Either way, I felt awful. As soon as the event was over, I approached my boss to apologize. He told me to wait for him in his office. Long story short, I was fired. My boss said since I was still in orientation, he had decided I wasn't a good fit for the company, so it was better to let me go now. He didn't outright say I was being fired for making fun of her drawing, but that's literally the only thing I've ever gotten in trouble for. My work, up until that point, had been praised. I didn't get much time to process it because my boss had already called up security, who showed up fairly quickly, and escorted me to my desk to gather my things before escorting me out of the building. An hour later I got a call from one of my former teammates, who asked if I wanted to join the team for a drink one last time. They needed it after the retreat, and felt bad they didn't warn me. I wasn't feeling up to it, but I wanted to try and make sense of the whole situation, so I went to the bar. In the back of my mind, I was thinking that since I'm about to start looking for a new job, a few references from former co-workers wouldn't be bad since I definitely won't be getting one from my boss. 
or the owner of the company after everything that happened. The team explained that Amy comes to all these retreats, and she always does some crude drawing like that. Everyone just sort of knows to say nice things about it and move on. One of my teammates said that once you've seen one of her drawings, you know what to look for. Well, I didn't, and nobody warned me. I started to get pretty upset that this was a known thing and everyone knew but me but what could I do? I had already messed up and it cost me my job. The team also shared more about Amy. Apparently she works at one of the satellite offices, but doesn't really do anything. The people in charge of the office try to come up with stuff for her to do because she gets upset when she's bored. The team said the way the people who worked there described it, they were basically her babysitter, so she wouldn't bother her dad all day when he spent most of his time there. And after he moved on to establish the new satellite office, he didn't take Amy with him because she liked all the friends she had at that office. They also said that her dad had harassed a few single guys at the office to take her on dates, which seemed pretty HR inappropriate. But he does own the company. My team said Amy desperately wants a boyfriend and wants to get married, which she talks about all the time. The consensus seemed to be that there is no way she actually understands how relationships or marriage works, and her dad probably puts this idea in her head to begin with. What if my teammates did joke that it wasn't a bad deal? Because whoever married her would inherit the company since she is the old man's only kid. I wasn't really in the mood for jokes at that point after losing my job over one, so I told them I needed to go. The only good thing is my former team members did say they would gladly give me a reference if I needed it, since they felt so bad about not telling me about the Amy situation to begin with. Oh, and the cherry on top? Amy sent me a Facebook friend request over the weekend. I haven't accepted it. I already upset her and it cost me my job. Part of me wants to accept it, apologize, and block her, but I'm not sure I'm ready for that either. I'm going to take a few days to get myself together and get my resume out there. Edit. After reading all the replies, including quite a few DMs and talking with a close friend, I've decided that I'm going to accept the friend request. I'll do an update if there's any sort of conversation. I plan to open with an apology. If she replies, great. If she doesn't, then at least I will have a clear conscience knowing that I've done the right thing. I do feel bad for OP in this situation as much as I feel bad for Amy. The mistake OP made was understandable, but at the same time, OP does need to give an apology for it. What he did was wrong, but with the context of the situation he was in, there wasn't really much he could do. He just got unlucky. I hope that the conversation between Amy and OP goes well. OP doesn't strike me as a bad person, just somebody who unfortunately made the wrong comment at the wrong time. Though again, it still does fall on him to make up for it. Update. If you saw my first post, you know that I got fired because I accidentally made a joke at the expense of the company owner's disabled daughter, Amy. During the last team building event of the day, we were pitching ideas for accounts, which included everything from jingles, my pitch, to storyboards, to slogans, to drawings. A lot of senior account managers were phoning it in, and people were making jokes about their work, which had a lot of people laughing. I got some jokes about my pitch and got a little overconfident, so when a crude drawing went up for the same account I did my jingle for, I made a joke about it. The joke was, well at least my jingle was way better than that. Did a three-year-old draw it? My joke was met with stone-cold silence, and a very negative reaction from the owner of the company. What my co-workers had failed to tell me was that Amy usually submits a crude drawing, which is a lot of work for her due to her issues, and everyone knows to say a few nice things and move on. I was new and wasn't informed, so my ignorance and inappropriate response cost me my job. After meeting with my team at a bar to begin the process of drowning my sorrows, I got a friend request from Amy on Facebook. That brings us to the update. First of all, thank you to everyone who made me laugh. The first time someone joked about me accepting the friend request, marrying Amy, and taking my revenge by inheriting the company made me uncomfortable. But by the third time I saw it mentioned, I couldn't help but laugh. A lot of you gave me good advice. I appreciate those who talked about legal action and what options I had. Unfortunately, I was still in orientation with my company, which is like a probationary period. During that time, they can let me go for any reason. They could fire me for wearing the wrong color socks if they wanted. I had to sign an agreement to get employed, which stated I understood this. There's literally nothing I can do, legally. At the end of the day, I decided to go have some drinks with a good friend, talk things out, and see what he would do. Dave's been my best friend since we were in elementary school. We've probably spent more time together than some actual brothers. Dave was firmly on the side of accept the friend request, apologize, and clear your conscience, man. I'm getting us another round of shots. He knows me better than anyone and knows that the guilt would have eaten me alive. I posted it here because it bothered me. I decided to take his advice and everyone here who pushed me for that as well, especially the ones that DM'd me. So that's what I did. I accepted the friend request. I immediately messaged Amy. I said I shouldn't have made that joke about anyone's work. It was unprofessional and I was sorry. It took her a while to respond, but when she finally did, she thanked me for my apology, but said she sent me the request because she wanted to apologize since I lost my job over it. I said she didn't owe me an apology. And there was another long pause before she asked if she could copy paste something to me. I wasn't sure what it was, but said she could. She pasted a generic message, but one she had clearly spent time on. I don't want to type it word for word, but I'll paraphrase. Hi, my name is Amy. Please forgive me if I'm slow to respond to you. I suffered a brain injury when I was a little girl and it takes me a while to type things out. 
There was more to it, but that's the basic stuff. I responded saying it was not a problem, and she could take all the time she needed. Amy and I ended up messaging back and forth until almost 3am. No, we didn't fall in love, we aren't going on a date, I'm not going to marry her for revenge so I can take her dad's company. However, I do think I would like to be friends with her. Not because I feel bad for her, but because she's genuinely a nice person and, honestly, everyone could use a few friends like that. We spent a lot of time talking about her. That's just the direction it went, so I asked questions since she seemed comfortable talking about it. Amy was in a car accident when she was a kid. She was in the car with her mom and they were hit by a drunk driver coming back from a birthday party for one of her classmates. Her mom didn't make it, and Amy suffered a brain injury that impacts her motor skills. Because it makes it difficult for her to speak and do simple things like getting dressed, making coffee, etc., people assume she's mentally challenged. She was put in special ed because of it, but worked really hard and graduated from high school. She even wanted to go to college, but her dad didn't think it was a good idea. Her life has been difficult because it's hard for her to communicate with people. By the time she can get a fully formed sentence out, the conversation is over. She can type slowly, but most people don't want to type when they're face to face. She's even admitted that when she's not at work, she will sometimes carry a tablet and pretend she's mute, because that's just easier. We eventually circled back to the drawing and my terrible response to it. She wasn't that offended by my response, because she assumed I didn't know. She got upset, primarily, because she knew all hell was about to break loose and she had no way to communicate with anyone. She was so upset when she found that I got fired, and tried to talk to her dad, but he wouldn't listen to her. She's fully aware that a lot of people at the company just pretend to be nice to her because she's the owner's daughter, but she does have a few friends at the satellite office where she works who better understand her disability. She gets frustrated because she can't truly contribute anything, but is happy when they are able to find busy work for her to do. It might take her all day to do something another person could do in a couple of hours, but it's better than sitting around bored all day. She knows she's a burden and a bother to her dad when he's around, but he's her dad and she loves him. She wishes every single day she was a daughter he could be proud of rather than a burden. She tries talking to him via emails and text messages, but he usually doesn't respond. If they're in the same location, he'll just walk over and respond verbally, which is frustrating because it becomes a one-sided discussion with her unable to do anything, but give simple one-word answers like yes and no. She also thanked me again for helping with her coffee. She said that when she was younger, she tried to do everything by herself and would get mad when people tried to help her, but now she's learned to appreciate the few who do. Most just stand there and look away, pretending to patiently wait for her to do it on her own. It was getting late for both of us at that point. Really late. It takes her a long time to respond to messages. There's misspellings. I get why someone would assume she's mentally challenged. I myself referred to her in my first post as having childlike mannerisms, which was a misunderstanding on my part. When she tries to force words quickly or emphasize something, she gets really loud, which makes her sound like an excited toddler rather than an adult trying to have a conversation. We ended our talk last night agreeing to talk again sometime. She asked if I had watched the first episode of House of Dragon yet, which I have, and she asked if I'd like to talk about it after she watches it. I told her I'd love to. So that's it. That's the update. Sorry to those who expected me to steal her dad's company. I'm definitely not doing that. Talking to Amy did make me feel a lot better though. I don't know how I'm going to handle the whole firing thing at my next interview, but a few of you suggested I just leave a gap on my resume. I may just do that. I doubt there will be any future updates, but at least this has a happier ending than my first post. TLDR since a few asked for it in my first post. I lost my job, but I may have gained a friend. Comment by OP. Hey everyone, I am the original OP. Someone linked me to this, and I'm blown away by all the positive comments here. I guess I can give you a small update since so many people have read what I expected to be a throwaway confession post to help me organize my thoughts after having my life upended due to what I perceived as a joke, but was actually quite unprofessional on my part. As many have recommended, in my next job, I won't open my mouth unless I have something positive to say, regardless of what others are saying. That lesson is learned. So, on to the small update. I talked with Amy again last night. She loved House of Dragon. We talked about a few characters and Amy picked up some things I didn't pick up myself, so I'm going to have to rewatch the first episode at some point. I wasn't really in the right headspace the first time I watched it, anyway, due to everything that had happened. Some of what we talked about last night was about me. I won't bore you with all the details, because I'm not all that interesting. But Amy is a saint. Saintess? She spent some time researching jobs for me and had several interesting ones for me to check out. I've decided to let myself breathe for the rest of the week, then hit the job hunt trail on Monday. I did find out some more interesting stuff about Amy. She currently stays by herself for the most part, in the house she grew up in. Her dad still technically lives there, but he mainly stays in an apartment near the newest satellite office. Amy thinks and actually hopes he has a girlfriend, but he denied it when she asked. He pays the bills and everything and visits periodically. She also has a caretaker who comes once a week to help as needed. But Amy says she doesn't really need one because she can order everything she needs online, gets her groceries delivered, etc. Part of the reason she spent the entire day in her dad's office during the retreat was because she misses him. I've begun researching AAC devices, and it seems like there might be some apps she can use, which I'm going to bring up since that's a quick download that could help her. Thank you to the commenter, one here and one in the original update, who mentioned Western Governors University. That seemed like the exact kind of program Amy needs for school, since she can go at her own pace. And while the school seems designed for those who want to earn their degree quick, it would also allow her to take the time she needs. I don't know much about her financial situation as a whole, but she did mention that she 
gets an allowance from her dad, which is her paycheck for working. Seems like he just pays her through the company and calls that her allowance. I didn't really pry, but I'll bring up the university at some point and let her decide if it's feasible. I'm assuming she has some financial means, either through her dad or from saving her allowance, because she mentioned she donates and volunteers at a dog rescue. That was a compromise with her dad when she asked to adopt a dog because he didn't think she could take care of it properly. I've been contemplating getting a dog myself, or was at least before I got fired. Amy suggested I stop by the rescue when she's there, and she'll help me pick one out, if I decide to do it. So, yeah, I think I have a friend, and I might be getting a dog. That was a very sweet ending to a story that started off very rocky. I'm glad that OP was able to meet with Amy and figure out who she is as a person. She seems really nice, and I'm glad they were able to become friends. I'm also very glad that this did not end up being a revenge story. Those are too common nowadays. It's good to hear a story that just ends in a good friendship.